box, then he will go. Then you have uh, more effort to make email. So if you have something interesting, then please directly ask to him. Okay, so uh, Professor Dirk, uh, now is your turn. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Edwin. And I'm very sure everything about evolution is interesting, right? So I still have to close some windows. Remind us that this is live streamed, all right, and recorded. I got it. Good, lovely. So hello, everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction, Edwin. So you still can hear me, I hope. All good, all good, good. So um, not too long ago, or still, uh, so let's say 70, 80 years ago, there was a saying of a uh, Russian professor Dobshansky. He said, nothing in the world makes sense except in the light of evolution. And he's basically right with it because everything we do and we see has indirectly uh, to do with what will happen in the future. So contributes in a way to evolution. I'd like to give you a highlight on what we're doing here in Munich. Over there in Munich, not here in Munich, but what I'm doing here and what I will then continue working over there in Munich because we are having a separate field inside evolutionary research, the so called molecular paleobiology. So this sounds a little bit scary, um, but you will see in a couple of minutes what it's all about. But first, you will see in the name of my title over here. This is because I pushed a different button here. So this is taking some time. In my title is also the word evolution. Dr. Edwin told me that last week he gave you a crude introduction very briefly. What is evolution? So if you would be asked now, you're going home this weekend to your parents, to your, to your grandparents, and uh, you tell them, hey, I had evolution class. And they'll tell you, and they'll ask, hey, okay, evolution, what, what is evolution? What is the answer you're going to give? You, for example, what's evolution? So, so think of the uh, living creatures that, uh, that they will be uh, adapting their nature that they have to survive. Yes and no. In the long term, you're right. But it's not how evolution primarily works. Before these small or other creatures have to change, this change has to be applied. How is this change applied? We are, we are all looking different here, right? Outside, the nature is different. We have 1.8 million species described. We believe we have 7.8 million in total. So a lot undescribed, a lot of chances for describing new species. How come that we have all these different species out there? What is a major trigger of evolution? Any idea? Okay, you can pass on the question. What is happening? Why do we all look different? Come on, you're, uh, you're going to be biologists and you're going to be asked, why are there amphibians, reptiles, whatever outside? What, why are there trees outside? What happened in the last 3.8 million years of organismal evolution? Billion years of organismal evolution. What is a major trigger? The colleague here already said correctly, yeah, some changes over time. What is mm -hmm. causing these changes? Genetics, yeah, how? You're right. Who, who said genetics? Was it you? All right, absolutely right. How? How is the genetic changing? Yes, how? How is the genetic changing? You're absolutely right. But what is the driving mechanism 
that the genetic is changing. Who does it? Is it the nuclear reactors? Mutation, how? Yes. Yes. Why do they change? You're absolutely right. That is a change. How, what is causing the change of the DNA over time? Hmm? The replication. Exactly. So, during the replication, he's happy. <laughs> so, the enzyme, the DNA polymerase, during every time when it's uh, creating the new daughter strand, it grabs maybe a wrong nucleotide, builds it in. Sometimes this is corrected immediately by the DNA uh, control mechanisms, sometimes not. If this is then kept, yeah, and is getting into the next generation, then we have a mutation, which is becoming a so-called substitution. Mutation is just a change of DNA. If it's fixed and gets into the next generation, we call it in evolutionary science substitutions. That's then a change that is lasting. So, how often do you think we have mutations? Often or not so terribly often? Yeah, we had 3 billion, 3.8 billion uh, years of uh, animal evolution. Quite some time, but still, okay, I'll give you the answer. We have it cont continuously. Our DNA polymerase makes error probably once every 100,000 base pairs. And this is pretty frequent. So, but this error is usually corrected immediately. And if it's not corrected, well, maybe it doesn't affect the evolutionary, evolutionary trajectory at all. Because to get a mutation, fixed in the next generation so your, your kids and grandchild and whatever will get it, it certainly has to be in our gametes yeah either in the, in the spermatocysts or in the ovarians if there are the mutations and they are not corrected by the control mechanisms then of course we bring it into the next generation and then comes what you said namely we check out whether this new genotype that we got based on this single mutation, has an evolutionary advantage by adaptation or disadvantage, and it will disappear from the, from the stage pretty quick. So evolution is therefore not that animals or whatever else is adapting. This is just, you know, this, this is just following it. Evolution is a change of the DNA over time. So the change of the allele combination of the different genomic makeup that we have over time. And based on this, these changes, then the phenotypic changes start. So what we look like. And based on this, we'll see if this mutation will be successful. Yeah, maybe my mutation makes me plain ugly. I won't get a wife and therefore this mutation will die, die out. Or it makes me super handsome and I'll get lots of, uh, lots of uh, offspring. Yeah, whatever, all possibilities. So this is coming after. So next time you ask, what is evolution? Please answer. It's a change of the genetic makeup throughout time. And this happened now for the last 3.8 million, sorry, billion years. Okay? Good. Anything else like natural selection, uh, survivors of the fittest is just coming afterwards. Of course, it's an integral part of evolution, but it's not the major trigger. The major trigger are, as you correctly said, the changes in DNA during replication, the happy accidents that occur during replication. Good. So now what I'm doing mostly in my work is a so-called molecular paleobiology. And molecular paleobiology is a pretty new field inside evolutionary science. Usually, what has to do with paleontology is, at least in Germany, it's more associated to the geosciences, not so much to the biosciences. I don't know how it's here. So it's handled pretty distantly from each other. Paleontology itself, yeah, you probably know it's a study of evolution of organisms for the last 3.8 billion years until Homo sapiens. So the paleontologists, they were all, always somewhere between biology and geology. You never know where to 
place them. Sometimes they're in the faculty of biology. In Germany, they're in the faculties of geosciences, but shouldn't matter so far. So what... Does not continue. No, no, it's all good. Yeah. So, classical paleontology has its geological focus. Checks out what is in the different layers, how things fossilize, um, and has a little bit of biological focus as well. What has been out there, uh, a little bit of how the fauna has been, landscapes have been, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then. However, we have therefore accumulated lots and lots of uh, collections, paleontology collections, which therefore are integral to understand what's been there. So, and if you want in a paleontological museum and there's a kind of open day, yeah, use a chance, go uh, take a look at the amazing displays, what they have there, not only in rocks, but fossils and whatever else, much more than they have at the exhibitions. And you're going to be amazed what they have there usually on stock. And these fossils, and the fossils themselves, they can tell us a lot of stories. They can tell us about all kinds of extinct organisms. They can tell us things that we do not know from biology such as Cambrian explosion. You've heard of Cambrian explosion before? Cambrian is a period of about 500, uh, 550 uh, million years ago. And that, and in a short window of something like eight, nine, up to 30 years, suddenly all kind of new organismal bow plants originated. Yeah, suddenly we find in the fossil record things like uh, arthropod, we find some, uh, we find annelids, we find uh, mollusks suddenly, we find all these different lineages which haven't been in the fossil record before. As if there was an explosion of, let's say, new types of organisms that suddenly occurred. This is the so-called Cambrian explosion. Also, mass extinctions. Yeah, we only know that there's been mass extinctions due to the fossil record. Yeah, suddenly we notice that lots of different things and uh, bow plants and organisms, and suddenly, and suddenly, uh, they are not around anymore. So there must have been an event which causes that there's been a lot and lot and lot of changes, um, and these have been then therefore the so-called mass extinction. I just have to fire that up again briefly. Thank you. Maybe that works now a bit better. Where's my computer? So, there we go. Thanks a lot. Let's hope that will work now. It's probably the, it's always the, the interference with, with the Zoom. So I guess if there's some activity on Zoom somehow, uh, then Zoom got priority and not the, 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 the remote here anymore. So, good. However, haha. The fossil record, however, is not able to tell us some other stories. So for example, how have been the phylogenies of those organisms which hardly fossilize? You know, all this soft stuff. Um, comb jellies, the jellyfish, whatever. You can imagine they have hardly hard components, they hardly fossilize. <laughs> And they also need to tell us anything about no, I think it's uh, hmm? okay, you got it now? You you still can hear me everywhere? Okay, good. Fossils can also not tell us when these changes took place particular if animals were very closely related to each other, lineages were closely related to each other. Fossils cannot tell us what happened, uh, who has been branching off first. Also, we only see that some new bow plants, yeah, the way these, organ these organisms have been organized, um, we see that they look different, but we do not know why it suddenly occurs that out of the blue, we get lots of different skeletons of calcium carbonate independently, mollusks, mollusk shells, bivalve, bivalve shells, uh, brachiopods, um, 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 
um, um, Nidarians, uh, corals, all of them have calcium carbonate shells that all originated independently from each other. This is something we observe, but we cannot explain with uh, paleontology. These mechanisms, how this evolution originated. Therefore, we are pretty lucky because all these different morphologies and bow plants of all these organisms we find in the fossil record. What do we see here, by the way? What are we having here? It's a fossilized starfish, okay. What is this lineage here called? Say again? No idea? What are we having here? This one here. That's an easy one. Come on. This here, these spiral things, they look like gastropod shells, and they are gastropod shells, snail shells. Good. What are we having here? Hey, you're a bio bio biologist in the making, a paleontologist, but you maybe see some resemblance. One, two, three, four, five, pentameric symmetry. Where do we have that? Also in starfish, but that's a crinoid, it's a sea lily. What are you having here? Look like isopods, but no, these are trilobites, so called trilobites, yeah. Nowadays, we would mix them up with this isopods, but it's a different lineage, still arthropods. These ones. If that's a starfish, then I have to re go to, 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 to college. <laughs> now, that's a brachiopod. It, it, it's usually in the deep sea, it's, uh, it's actually hard to recognize. What, what are we having here? An ammonite. So, what's an ammonite? What are the closest relatives to ammonites these days? Cephalopods. Good, thank you. Good, pleased to hear that. So you see, they are all have all different bow plants. So all different way of organization. But fortunately, the difference here is entirely based on it's enter wrong button. Entirely based on DNA. And this is where molecular paleobiology hooks up and starts. So molecular paleobiology tries to take the fossil record, which is geologic, but also the detected genetic fossil record, and combine that together to answer those questions that classical paleontology or biology cannot answer. You might think directly of Jurassic Park. That's not what we're doing. We, it would be, of course, cool if you come to us as with a Bachelor Master project and you get T Rex back to life. That would be certainly cool. But uh, this is probably not feasible. And if you succeed doing that, let us know in advance so we can ever create the building. But what we definitely do is work with ancient DNA. Ancient DNA is all that DNA that's been done, that's, that's already been gone for quite a while, and maybe only left over in very small traces. Actually, that's what Jurassic Park tries to work with. Yeah? Get a little bit of the, the T-Rex tissue and put it into, into a crocodile embryo, and voila, we have something new and spectacular. In a way, ancient DNA is tricky. It's a pretty delicate technique. The problem is, in that moment the organism dies, the DNA will be chopped into very many small pieces. Too small to work with, too small to handle usually, unless we are very lucky and the preservation of the DNA was pretty good. Problem is contamination. If there's hardly any DNA left in your sample, imagine you take a, a mammoth, and you have still the chance, you got from the permafrost a little bit of tissue of the mammoth, you extract DNA, DNA will be in very small pieces. Hardly DNA. You theoretically still could work with it. And then you go and grab it and you work with it and you contaminate it fully with your Homo sapiens DNA. You shed off lots of DNA all the time. Therefore, work with ancient DNA, particularly human ancient DNA, Neanderthal or whatever, is done in dedicated institutes. 
with a dedicated workflow. You can only enter a room in the one direction, but you cannot come back, not to bring contamination from room number two back to room number one. You have to wear all these, these, these complete protection, you're in, in sterilized um, room conditions, etc. And this is because the very first ancient DNA papers from the 2000s, oh, late 90s, where the first fragments of the Neanderthaler have been uh, analyzed and published in Nature and Science, whatever, yeah. Of course, cool Neanderthaler DNA, a close relationship of, human, of Homo sapiens resolved, suddenly turned out to be mostly contamination of one of the technicians in the lab. Too bad. Now we know better. Therefore, we have to take these kind of extra measurements to prevent all kind of contamination. Still, the range we can use it is very limited. I wrote here one million years, but this is very seldom. Very, very seldom. Usually, you won't get DNA older than just a couple of tens of thousand years. You might find in the literature that something has been found, protein residues of 800,000 uh, year old organisms, but this is so rare. So therefore, Jurassic Park is still very far from us. However, what we definitely try is to use then the DNA to infer so-called molecular clocks. These molecular clocks, uh, there we take all these mutation steps that we have since the present, calculate it back and try to calculate back uh, with a bunch of smart algorithms when actually all these organisms might have split off from each other. Here are some of the, uh, the uh, phyla of, uh, of uh, animals. This is what we have as a fossil record. Here's the Cambrian explosion, just mentioned it earlier. The red dots are justified or verified uh, fossils yeah, from lots of the, 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 these different organisms, we have finally a fossil record, but pre-Cambrian, we hardly have anything. And the organisms are probably older than the Cambrian. When did they now finally diverge? This is where the DNA comes into, into play. So we try to trace back with DNA when the individual splits took place, telling us that all the bilaterians, uh, have been split, uh, the bilaterians here including, have been split about 680 uh, million years ago. Maybe the origin of all animals has been something like 700 or so years ago, maybe 800, whatever. So numbers that the fossil record cannot tell us. This is what we try in molecular paleobiology, to understand what happened where the fossil record does not give us any kind of we also try to understand how new skeletons originate. I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, this is a calcareous sponge, and you see it has skeletal elements nicely stacked together in a rather old and rather simple organism. We try to find uh, how these nice arrangements actually took place. How come that a simple organism can produce over hundreds of million years all these kinds of skeletal elements, put them nicely together in a fashioned way, uh, um, unchanged for the last couple of hundred million years, and is therefore pretty useful for it and its survival. So we not only look at the morphology, how that works, we certainly look also what have been the driving forces molecularly. Now we can stain these skeletal elements to check out where new growth of the skeletal elements is. And we take a look at the proteins and stain them individually. Here's the blue dots here and the red dots. These are all those proteins that make sure that these individual skeletal elements are produced. And therefore we're trying to check what is necessary and how a rather simple organism as a sponge already hundreds of million years ago was able to do so. And particularly, under the changing ocean chemistry, the way the ocean is now in terms of calcium or magnesium was not always the case. Sometimes we had uh, more magnesium, sometimes more calcium. So the oceans in that time were chemically for the last couple of hundreds of million years completely different. How does a simple organism survive these changing conditions? Also looking in the future, the ocean is changing. The pH is getting lower, 
So temperatures are rising. How are sponges, corals, whatever dealing with that trouble, particularly with respect to the skeletal elements? Can they still build these beautiful reefs or will they die out? And if they die out, who will take over? This is also something what paleology asks, but in terms of questions for the future. To understand all this, we are very much focusing on these guys here, these sponges, because we are very much interested in what the last common ancestor of all animals looked like. The last common ancestor would have been here, from which then the sponges split off and all other organisms subsequent. So a sponge, this is therefore a lineage which is already millions of years old, therefore has in its genomes probably still all the information copying what the last common ancestor of all animals looked like. And this is what we count. Who of you guys has seen living sponges in the sea? Snorkeling, maybe diving. Who of you knows what a sponge is? Who of you does not know what a sponge is? So obviously a lot of people don't know if they know or do not know sponges. Okay, good, all right. You fifth semester biology, right? Okay, so you went a little bit through systematics. Yeah, there was this chapter with peripherence of sponges where usually lecturers go very quickly over it because it's not too much to tell about. They tell you that there's a lot to tell about. Usually when I talk about sponges, I get uh, sponges. Oh, great. Yeah, we have them in the kitchen. Hooray, sponges. Oh, yeah, sponges. Hey, now SpongeBob. Great. Hooray. Okay, we did a lot of publicity for sponges, no doubt. But it takes them quite a while to confirm, to 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 make sure that people see and appreciate that the sponge is just more than this SpongeBob or something in school, uh, in, uh, you, you find on, on, on television, that they're among the most beautiful organisms you can think of in the sea. Corals as well here, all right. Because they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, you know, like in this organ shape or stalked or with beautiful surface patterns or with these kind of, uh, of stars on the, their surface uh, with polygonal grooves or with uh, a reticulate uh, surface, how we call it, or it can look like golf, golf balls, or you, we also call it the moon sponge here. So it can look pretty spongy, or they can look fistulous, how we call it here. Or you see, sponges have a lot and a lot of different shapes and flavors colors, strictly beautiful. But they're not only in the sea and look beautiful, they're also very diverse and very successful already for hundreds of million years, if you've seen. There's lots of functions of the sponge that are so much underestimated. For example, what does a sponge do? It has very important functions in the ecosystem. One of the most important functions is filtrating activity. You might have seen this. These images of a barrel sponge over here, for example, where a little bit of fluorescent dye is applied. And you see within shortest time, the, fun, the, the pumping activity of the sponge brings everything from the outer tissue inside and out again. So within a couple of seconds, this fluorescent dye makes its way through the sponge and is getting out here again. You see how quick it does. One liter sponge, 10 by 10 centimeters, pumps you 10 liters within one minute. So they are one of the most powerful uh, filtrators in the sea. Another example, this is by the way, one of the barrel sponges where Dr. Edwin did his PhD on. This is a pretty nice from the Caribbean. It's usually not so yellowish, but it's uh, an old image with the uh, wrong color. And if you apply it here, you see within seconds, it is smoking 
quite some beautiful smoke rings out. You see how quick that does. It does not do justice by its rich motif. Yes. The important function here is that the nutrients of the water are brought back into the system. If you see movies of coral reefs, coral reef waters, what does it look like? Is it murky or is it crystal clear? Crystal clear. But there's lots of biodiversity there. Lots of biodiversity needs lots of food. Crystal clear water means crystal clear water means that there's hardly any food in there. So how does it work? Yeah, the water is clear, but there's still a lot of organisms in there. Yeah? So the water is strongly oligotrophic, hardly any nutrients, but still lots of stuff that's living there. This is because sponges take all the ins they're sitting inside the coral reef, they pick up the dissolved organics and other components, build them into their tissue. And then they release the tissue as particles. And these particles are then picked up again by the nadarians uh, by, or by other corals, etc. And this is something that we call the so-called sneezing of the sponge. This is a sponge's face. This is a beautiful time lapse. That should have looked a little bit different. I'll try it again. So this is a beautiful time lapse of, oh, this is very short here, so sorry about that, where you see that a bunch of particles is secreted out and you see that there's lots of uh, so-called contractions of that, uh, of that sponge that sheds out all these kind of individual particles. These are tissue cells now full with these with this nutrients that can be then picked up and is going to be fed then by all the uh, by all the codes. So another image video. I hope this lasts now a little bit longer. There we go. This is also one of these Aprisina sponges. And you see what's happening here. It's continuously, this is a time lapse, of course, as continuously particles and cells removed out of the ostia, so out of the pores of the sponge. Yeah, so cleaning it from sediment, but also removing lots of tissue. And these tissue, their remains, are then picked up by all the corals, and they are able to grow and survive and live and, and be happy. This is actually something due to the contraction possibilities of the sponge. We're going to have a look at it a little bit later. So therefore, filtrating and bringing back the nutrients, an important um, capacity of the sponges. They are also in the sea and erode, eroding. That means they resolve the calcium carbonate from the coral. They bring the calcium carbonate back into the system, so they can etch out a little bit of calcium carbonate. They set themselves in there, so they make a small cavity for themselves. But with this, they destruct therefore all the dead um, the skeletons of the corals and bring the calcium carbonate back into the system. Once you see an oyster. Turn it around and you might see lots of yellow dots. These are then so-called excavating sponges, which therefore make sure that calcium carbonate is getting back to the system. Sponges can form reefs. They did it in the past quite a lot. Now these days, not that frequently anymore, mostly in the deeper seas and around um, Antarctica and in Canada. So in terms of reef formation, they have been very important also to glue coral rubble together and get some new substrate for new coral reefs after hurricanes, for example. They're also providing lots of habitat for other organisms. That's a sponge here, that's not the sponge. Yeah? So in these openings, there can be lots of organisms that find shelter, that find space, that find uh, uh, very beautiful locations to sit and uh, bloom, etc. So they are actually small hotels for larger, but also for smaller organisms such as the microbes. In sponges, in if you dry a sponge, up to 20-30% of the dry mass can be microbes. 
And these microbes say they're important for getting new uh, components for the survival of the sponge, for defense, etc., etc. And then, of course, why else do we need the sponges? Of course, for us, for our own interest as bathing sponges, but also for the pharmaceutical industries. So, so that means these sponges are peculiar. And the peculiarity has been detected already for quite a while. The first person who was asking itself, what kind of organism is a sponge? Is it a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a fungus? Was Aristotle. He thought, he was the first one thinking, hey, this could be an, an animal. Others, a couple of hundred years later, thought, oh, something between plant and the animals, uh, we are not sure about that. Linné thought, oh, yes, it's an algae, no doubt. And then later he changed his mind and said, oh, yes, it's an animal. Lamarck said, oh, it's a polyp. For Lamarck, everything was a polyp which didn't have any kind of legs and eyes. So therefore, it was pretty easy for him. And uh, Ernst Haeckel was in a bit more diplomatic and called these sponges plant animals, put them then therefore in his famous phylogenetic tree somewhere already at the base of all animals, so far correct in this way. But what is now the trouble with these sponges? Why did now so many researchers have trouble to understand what it is? This is best depicted by this show and tell of the sponges here. You just, hey, I'm a sponge, I'm just filtrating water. Hey, that's it. There's not, not a lot, obviously, to talk about. Of course, he doesn't have, a sponge doesn't have a gut, a nerve system, no gonads, no sensory organs, no muscles, no nothing. So nothing to place it somewhere closer to animals or to plants. And therefore, it's either secondarily optimized, the sponge, or it's primary primitive. What is it? We see sponges are already among us for quite a while. And if you take a look at this time scale here, we already find sponges already present, at least some justified, verified, verified sponge records here at the Ediacaran time. This is a, one of the first sponge fossils, 570 years ago, pretty old. There are some fossils in which we think it could be animals, but we are not sure that it's a sponge, which is already deep in the Neoproterozoic, so something like 630 years ago. And some fossil biomarkers, or just some molecules, which are assumed to be produced by the sponge, we are not very sure about that, but they are, can fossilize these biomarkers already deep in the cryogenian, so more than 700 million years ago. So fact is that these sponges are pretty old, obviously. And we do know for sure, not so much about this time, but we do know that in the Cambrian, they were the most important reef builder. If you went diving, 500 million years ago, 540 million years ago, you would only see reefs on this in the sponge. No corals yet. They didn't exist. They came later. Competition originated for building reefs. Corals, biozoans. Suddenly, the sponges got competition from those organisms that tried the same. Access to the sea, uh, access to good spots in the current, access maybe to the light, competition works. Predators came, fishes, uh, and, and the reptiles, whatever else. The sponges are just sitting there in the reef, doing nothing, full of proteins. Every predator will think, hey, no, that's an easy protein snack. I'll just eat it. Therefore, there's quite some stress, evolutionary stress on those, on those sponges. And this stress certainly rose when more and more trouble originated by other competitors, like ascetians, for example, and parasites, fungi, bacteria. The sponge cannot do anything here. It cannot scratch if it got an infection. It cannot do anything when it got an infection. It cannot run away from the predator. 
how did a sponge survive those 500, 600 million years ago until now? Obviously unchanged. How did they do that? Any idea? They didn't have arms. At that time, they still don't to push them away. They didn't have any, any other things morphologically to put them to make sure these guys were kept on distance. What did the sponges do? What did they invent? Any idea? Yeah? Who just said that? Toxins. Yes. They produce a huge battery of biochemical compounds, which are active against all these guys there. They are the most proliferate producers of biochemical compounds. And we still use them to find new structures for the pharmaceutical industries. Antiviral, antibiotics, anti-plasmodial, so anti-malarial, uh, anti-inflammatory. Pharmaceutical companies find these are new structures which have good properties which can be used for the future and for, for new drugs. The most potent um, um, anti-herpes medication is directly coming from the sponge. A little bit modified, but the backbone of the structure is taken there. So therefore, it was a chemical warfare between then the sponges and the others. And this is what you still see in the coral reefs these days. If you go diving or snorkeling, it's already sufficient because it's close to the surface. On the left-hand side here, you see some images of the corals, and on the right hand side, you see the sponges competing for surface, for space, to the best spots to live. In the middle, you see a white line. This white line is, a, is, a, is a looking like a demilitarized zone, but it's a zone of death in between where both sides attack each other with, the chemical, with their chemical weapons and try to overgrow each other. You see on the right hand side and uh, left hand side here, you see the coral polyps already white. So they are dead. So the coral, so the sponge on the right hand side here is already effective in killing the polyp here and will probably also die. We ask the questions. Obviously, this chemical production has been important for sponge survival in the evolution of the sponges. Did it now evolve early? How did it rapid, how did it diversify? How does it is it possible that a, such a simple organism produces that many compounds with maybe a very simple genome? We don't know. So the, me the mechanisms for this are largely unknown. And this is where we have our research questions. We need to understand how actually are these sponges related, who is producing to who, which what sponges produces, which compounds, and what are particularly the genomic mechanisms. And to answer these questions, we have some pet animals in our aquaria in Munich. This is Tetia wilhelma. It's a sponge which grows very nicely in aquaria. And this has lots of pretty cool properties. First of all, it is contracting. It's a time-lapse uh, video of a contracting sponge. So within a couple of hours, it's pumping, it's contracting. So an organism which does not have any muscles, any nerves, because it didn't evolve at that stage, it's still able to do this kind of movements. How? Understanding that would help us to understand how the last common ancestor of all animals was able to do this kind of movements. The sponge is also, this sponge is also known as the fastest sponge on earth because it is really moving as a sponge. It's more, you know, putting out some filaments and then dragging along these filaments, etc. So for a sponge, it is pretty fast. Still, uh, it takes for, for a 100 meter sprint 250 days, but for the sponge, it is still not too bad. Locomotion. No, the first time in animals, how did it occur? No nerve, no muscles, works somehow. Then this sponge is so nice. It provides us with lots and lots of offspring, shedding off 
small baby sponges asexually. Yeah, uh, so we get immediately lots of samples to, uh, to do continuous research. You see here, this, this is running away from the mother. So don't we, don't we at some stage do anyway? Don't we, don't we do all? So they provide us with lots of clonal organisms to continue therefore our research. And as they are the primitive, at a very high regeneration, this is a sponge cut, cut open. I cut this into two halves. I forced it, otherwise it won't run away with some toothpicks on the, on the substrate. And within just two days, you see that the wound here, so the yellow is the inner part here, is completely healing. Again, you see also some worms running around there. Yeah, uh, they use a sponge as a habitat. But in shortest time, this is now there's no time axis here. But these are now 96 hours in total, and the wound is completely healed. complete regeneration. So therefore, even if a fish bites off the sponge, the remainder there will regrow as a new an adult and successful sponge. So therefore, these guys are very cool to understand what had happened evolutionarily at the base of the animal tree. So, sponges, okay. But to understand what this guy looks like, it would also be cool to know who has been the last common ancestor that's right. The closest relative here to all animals. What is the closest relative to all animals? Which lineage is this? Ladies and gentlemen. I put a blue bar on it here, yeah, but the, the sister group to all animals. What are you having? Any idea? Fungi are somewhere here. There's still some guys in between, but fungi are pretty close. Pretty close. Who is the ancestor? Not the ancestor, oh, that's wrong. The sister group, the closest relative to all animals. Any idea? Let me help you. Quanophagans. Unicellular organisms which look like something like this one over here. Quanophagans. With a unicellular organism, as I mentioned, with a flagellum and a small collar. Yeah, therefore they're called quanophagellates. Here with a, with, with a different image in the fluorescent microscopy. And what they do is they already form small aggregations. And the movement of this aggregation can already be controlled. Although every single unit here is still individual. So here we see a first attempt to get from a unicellular organism to a multicellular organism. And all animals are multicellular. And the way from unicellularity to multicellularity is therefore one of the most important steps that make in the evolution the animal and animal. They are aggregating together and already form the first types of, you know, almost multicellular organisms. And these guys here, you also find in the sponge tissue, in a way, as the so-called quanocytes in the quanocyte chamber, they kind of look the same, and they make up in the quanocyte chamber of the sponges, the tissue that is taking care of all that pumping by coordinated movement of the plugin. So if you zoom in here, those quanocytes of the sponge look pretty much like quanoflagellates, so therefore yeah, the ancestry of quanoflagellates closely related to animals can be nicely shown by already by the morphology. Here close up, this is a cross-section of one of these 
coanocytes with the collar and the, fla and the flagellum. The flagellum is, is causing a current bacteria food particles. Food particles are then. Are we okay? Yeah. Sorry about that. Ah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, my, I'll try to be a bit more careful. So everyone awake again? Good. So all good here? Yeah? All right, good. So the movement of the flagellum causes that uh, bacteria are uh, are, are getting um, are getting um, dragged to this collar and can be then therefore picked up as food. This is the way how that works. This is the way also the coanoflagellates use to pick up food. So therefore, the close relationship. So therefore, we get an idea how the coanoflagellates are, and we have an idea how these sponges, that these sponges are actually at the base or early branching among all other organisms, all other animals. There was another question to be solved. These sponges, at a certain moment, there was molecular data suggesting that these sponges would not be monophyletic. Usually these sponges are split up Traditionally, they were into three classes, glass sponges, hemosponges, calcareous sponges, sister group to all other animals. But then molecular data suddenly showed that there would be another group, these homoscular moths. Previously thought to be close related to them, but now suddenly molecular data brought them closer to these eumetazoans. And you might think, mm, I don't care doesn't matter. Why should I give, why should I be worried about how the relationship of these sponges are? Because you should, if the sponges are not monophyletic, then the last common ancestor of all animals, metazoans, we got some sponges, then the next last, then the coming Ancestor was also sponge grade. The next one was sponge grade until we get up here. That would mean we all, you all would be modified sponges. Not a nice thought. If they would, however, be monophyletic, we don't have to worry about it. Also, with consequences for the evolutionary understanding of the characters. If we all are modified sponges, yeah, then the aquiferous system, the way the sponge is picking up food and, uh, and is, uh, is uh, processing food would be different. And the gut with which we currently process food would be a kind of evolutionary novelty, definitely not present at the last common ancestor of all animals down here. The last common ancestor would therefore then be sponge -like. But to make a very long story very short, I can assure you with new molecular data, genomic data, that the sponges are monophyletic and you do not have to fear at all there's something spongy in your ancestry. So, now, we try now to understand the evolution of all animals by looking at the genome of the sponge. Talking about genomes. I asked this question already yesterday, got pretty funny answers. In each of your, almost each of your cells, you have a complete genome, right? Otherwise we would be pretty much in trouble. How long is the DNA in each of your cells? First of all, in meters, how long is the DNA thread? Any idea? Ah, you shake your head, but try it anyway. Give a good guess. It's not that long. No, it's not that long. 
in, in one cell, just in one single cell. In cell, one cell. Yeah, you take your 23 chromosomes times two, you tie them together, and you get a thread of one meter 80. It's not so long. Okay, but how many base pairs, how many nucleotides that Homo sapiens has in its genome? How many nucleotides? So how many bases, A, C, Gs, and Ts? Yeah, this one meter 80 thread. How many bases, how many nucleotides are there? Yes, it's four different, but how many are then put together to get this one meter 80? Any idea? How many nucleotides, how many base pairs has your genome? Any idea? Any educated guess? Any educated number? Hmm? Three billions. You looked it up, right? <laughs> Three billions haploid, six billion diploid. You have it from your mother and your father. Okay, yes, yeah, so three billion. Billion. So that's a three with nine zeros. How many, and don't look it up, how many proteins are these three billion base pairs coding? Proteins like, uh, like uh, my like keratin, like uh, pepsin, like uh, myosin and actin. Yeah, all these things which are coded on the DNA. How many different genes do we have here? Good, who has an idea? Maybe you, last row, yes. Just get an educated guess. Proteins, how many proteins are you made of? How many different ones? And you, and you, and you, and you, we are all made of proteins. Look at each other, only proteins so far, right? Beautiful proteins, no doubt, yeah, but how many different? Any guess? No, shaking your head. About 25,000. It's not a lot. When the first genome was sequenced in the 1990s, 25,000 was the number where we thought, where we thought oh, that's the problem here. Where we thought, oh, that's not. And now we start sequencing, uh, or we successfully sequenced already the first couple of sponges. The sponge genome is considerably smaller, probably something like 140 million, opposed to 3 billion or 6 billion. So it's a logarithmic unit smaller, a couple of logarithmic units. However, it then turned out that the sponge genome harbors 37,000 protein coding genes. 37,000, 50% more than Homo sapiens. What a disgrace. The sponge seems to have more proteins. We don't know if these are active proteins. We only see the genes. We don't know what's happening with them. Some of these genes are just hypothetical. We biomethematically find that they're on the genome. Yeah, we've never seen the proteins. Anyway, 37,000, 50% more. Are we secretly outsmarted by sponges and we don't know? So keep in mind, the size of a genome and the number of proteins do not tell us anything about evolutionary possibilities. It's just a combination of what we can do with these proteins and uh, uh, yeah, how we can use them the smartest way. So just to give you a crude idea what is happening on, 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 on genome. Most of your genome, your 8 billion base pairs, is just junk, not coding. 1% is coding, 99% is not coding, still of evolutionary importance, yeah, but that would bring us a bit too far. But all the genes are just one lousy 
person. And there are other organisms like amoeba that have 300 times more DNA than we do. 200, 300, 200 times more. Yeah? 600 billion base pairs are just unicellular amoeba. So the amount of DNA doesn't tell us anything. DNA lengths can easily be extended. Yeah, there's lots of the genomic mechanisms that duplicate DNA, that add additional DNA, that copy and paste DNA. It doesn't tell us anything. So the huge genomes do not necessarily mean that we have evolutionary advantage. So we are now trying to find how we get some cool features in those sponges, what sponges can do, and how some uh, funny stuff of those sponges originate, such as carnivores. Did you know that sponges are not sitting there and pump? No, they can also be carnivores. Predators, mostly in the deep sea. Where then these sponges do not have any kind of access to the regular food what sponges have in the career. It was a big surprise that suddenly carnivorous sponges have been found. They eat something like small uh, crustaceans, amphipods. They are getting stuck on these tentacles. And these tentacles consist of skeletal elements which are like Velcro. So all the appendices, so the antenna and the legs and whatever else are getting stuck. Yeah, so they, they get in here and are getting stuck here and uh, are not able to get to, to get out there again. As you can see, somehow, maybe we can switch off the light here so it's a bit easier to see. Is there a way to switch off the light? Yeah, maybe a bit better. So, thank you, Edwin. So, you see, and then an isopod is entangled. It's, it tries to struggle its, its way off. However, it is impossible for him to get the meat. And the more it struggles, yeah, like in these Venus fly traps, uh, the, the more it, uh, it gets entangled in these kind of Velcro like. Uh, like skeletal elements. And once it's completely tired, like that one here, it is slowly, and you'll see that in a couple of, couple of seconds, it's completely going to be overgrown by the sponge. You see the sponge entirely changes its morphology, it digests the isopod, or amphipod or whatever they have been. And at a certain moment, once it's finished eating, it just releases the dead empty carbon. This is certainly a pretty funny adaptation of the sponges in the deep sea. This is what you have to do when you're in, in regions in the deeper seas where there's no usually access to all kinds of light conditions and, uh, and uh, food conditions, which are then mostly preferred by, by the sponges. But sponges can do more than just being in the sea and, uh, and pumping or being carnivores. And one of the reasons why I'm here, because Dr. Edwin is working on the sponges, is that the sponges also in particular, adaptation to fresh something everywhere. In the Lake Titicaca on the highest mountain lakes up to, yeah, basically everywhere here around in the rivers around Surabaya. I forgot the name of the river. Yes, yes exactly that one. Thank you. So. And there they were really very, very successful. This is an evolutionary success story because you find them basically everywhere in all regions. And if you go diving or snorkeling, maybe in ancient lakes such as uh, Lake Tanjanica, Lake Beaver, or some of them, and you pick up a boulder, you see that they're completely encrusted by all these kind of freshwater sponges, full, completely full of those sponges. Highly successful here. 
What they do, however, is they need substrate, substrate to grow on. If the riverbed is just sandy, they cannot do anything. So they take instead a shell of a snail or of a bivalve and attach to it. So therefore, you find them frequently, strongly attached to usually mollusk shells or anything else. And then they start overgrowing them rapidly. You know, you see here, this, this poor snail, they have a tiny pond what attached to and that completely overgrows it. And the snail has now a huge after it. Yeah? What you see here is not a snail on a sponge. It's a sponge on a snail. You see a tiny sponge completely outgrows So they are very successful. Why are they so successful? So in other evolutionary success story are the gamules. Gamules are small, endurant, asexual reproduction bodies. These small thingies here, they are produced continuously in the sponge cell, uh, in the sponge body. They look like many balls. It's a very hard outer region. They can withstand temperatures of my and minus 90 degrees easily for a long time. They can withstand drought. They can withstand basically if you could shoot the thingy into space and bring it after a couple of months back and you will get out of this a new sponge again. Because out of these gamules, a new juvenile sponge, this is what you're currently trying in your office, a new sponge is hatching. So these gamules consist of lots of cells which are used for feeding, so yolk rich cells, and lots of cells, so called totipotent cells, out of which all kinds of other cells can be, can be developed. So, and together with a rigid outer layer here, we get a pretty powerful gamule with food and totipotent cells and armor around, which can be therefore be easily transported somewhere, can be shot into space, can be frozen liquid nitrogen, it can withstand all the nasty. Uh, temperature. So, these outer regions, these shells, can be either very strong, very hard, so you can step on it, you can even, uh, uh, I don't know, all kinds of earth movement can occur and nothing will, will happen to it. And when the situations are favorable again, a new spawn will hatch. Or it can also be that the outer region is rather light. And therefore, these gamules are then swimming and therefore can reach other regions in the sea um, or in the, in the lacustrine environment and get therefore all over the world. You see lots of air chambers here causing that these gamules can be produced, can be transported easily everywhere. Or these outer layers have small hooks. And these small hooks are used to be hooked up by birds. These birds are landing in the, in the water. They get in touch of a sponge. This hook is getting into the feathers and the bird gets one of these gamules and transport it to the next environment. So therefore, the transportation of the freshwater sponges is easily facilitated with the highly evolved stadium based gamut. Therefore, you can find these freshwater sponges even on trees. Tree sponges here, and sometimes in elevations up to 15 whatever meter, because this might be then waters which can be uh, which can which can rise temporarily. And when it's getting dry again, you still see the leftovers of the sponges in the tree. Still surviving there. And even if they wouldn't survive, they still would have the gamules, which make sure they make it nicely in the next generation. So you might think that these gamules had therefore direct influence on the success of the distribution of extinction. And yes, this guy here. From being like this, a pretty rigid gamule, very elaborate gamule, 
and you find it basically everywhere from North America or on the Northern Hemisphere, almost in all the years. However, there are some of those sponges, some families that do not produce them at all. And you notice that those that do not produce them are mostly stuck to some very local region. Here and here and here and here and here. So they do not extend at all. So this is also an important feature for those sponges to distribute. It was for a long time thought that those guys here, they would be monoselective. So that the loss of gamutes, of the non-production of gamutes, only originated once. We could, however, with molecular tools, easily show that this is not the case, that we find them distributed everywhere, those sponges that, that are not producing gamutes at all. So we took a slightly closer look how this takes place the gain and the loss of the gamuts. And we took samples from all over the world, ancient lakes like Lake Titicaca and 3,000 meters, Lake Victoria, other ancient lakes like uh, Lake Tiberias. So ancient lakes are those lakes which are not caused by glacial, but, um, by, but by tectonic events. So they're mostly than 100,000 years old and older, and have therefore a huge radiation of lots of different organisms. And we got lots of samples from each of them and wanted to check how easily is the capability to produce or to lose the production of the gamuts is facilitated. With a bunch of molecular markers, we could not see it. What you see in blue here are those that have been collected. Um, from other regions and are not producing gamuts. And those in black that you see here, it's very small to see, but anyway, these are those that produce gamuts and are therefore widespread. And the blue ones are just local. And if we zoom in, we see that those that are very endemic, that are not producing any kind of gamuts, are hardly different evolutionary. Yeah, this is a phylogenetic tree, and you see half in branches, are hardly genetically different from those that produce. So it's easy to switch on or off a gene, obviously, which makes sure that the gamut are produced or not. And therefore, we probably have all kinds of samples from a huge founder population from which has been widespread, and then only occasionally in Lake Titicaca or over here or wherever else, the potential to switch, uh, to produce gamuts has been switched off. This is therefore gigantic influence on the overall distribution of the sponge. This is what we currently also trying to research here, also with samples from Indonesia, to give you with this a crude idea what my and our research is currently. Everything certainly in the light of evolution, because don't forget evolution is basically everything. You guys are evolution. And I hope I could uh, bring you a little bit of insight. What is evolution? What we research to understand who's the last common ancestor of all animals? why we need that, why we do that with sponges. Maybe you guys are interested at some stage to conduct some sponge research. We have a highly qualified sponge researcher over here. And maybe at a certain moment, we will therefore meet somewhere on a conference and discuss about evolution and other cool and fancy things of sponges. But you also see in terms of just understanding evolution, these guys are really fantastic organisms to look at. And to work. Okay, so far my sermon. Thanks a lot. And I'm open to all kinds of questions, being it about evolution of sponges or anything else. Uh, yeah.
and also I attached a more important term now because uh, in our proposed lab, how much people do micro by the billion and micro country? So some of your senior try already to micro plastic pollution with hand on the uh on the left. So we went somewhere that we got micro plastic and micro plastic in this module. So if you google it, the system of water for I think that also research some micro plastic in the department of water plastic in Germany. It used to be a student also researcher microplastic in the uh, in the marriage project. So uh, the senior now also you now in in this early department to do microplastic I Good. All right. Thanks. Very good question. The first was how the timing of DNA was done. Okay. So there are the so called molecular clocks, which ideally should a kind of behavior that at a certain moment every couple of years you find in the tree of life a substitution. This is not always the case, unfortunately. Uh, some lineages are faster, some lineages are slower. So therefore, there is no exact timing of the molecular clock. So we need a bunch of algorithms which take into consideration that some lineages are faster, some are, sl some are slower in evolution. So these algorithms need calibration. And for this calibration, we need fossils. And these fossils are then used as data points from which the mutation time of the DNA has been calculated back, from which we can then extrapolate how other organisms are then, um, um, from which we can uh, extrapolate when has been the split of other organisms. So it's a mixture of good calibration by either fossils or geologic events, yeah, like closing of land bridges or uh, something like that. And uh, the usage of algorithms which try to estimate how frequently the DNA changes throughout time, but also take into consideration that every lineage might have a different speed. This is a complete lecture I could give you as well, but to make a very long story short, this is it. Your second question. With the uh, with the uh, with the um, uh, carnivorous sponges. So what's happening? The the isopod or the amphipod or whatever it is, yeah, is entangled. Then it's overgrown. So it's a complete layer of new tissue is going over that organism. It takes a couple of days. So it was a timeless that that I showed you. And then some digestive enzymes are produced that go through the outer skin and digest therefore everything in there and the absorption 
can be done via the tissue itself. We, it, it does not need a gut, or it actually reinvents a gut-like structure every time that it has uh, it has uh, caused um, caused some fray. Yeah. At this moment, the outer tissue becomes a kind of digestive tissue because it it, it produces then then uh, enzymes digesting everything. Yeah. And uh, and uh, once once it's finished, it just becomes out of tissue again and opens up. So we don't need a special structure as a gut. Of course, much easier with a gut, yeah? So you can take a burger and you eat while you go, yeah? But uh, it is the other way. Okay, does it answer your question? Yes. Good. Yeah, this is number three and four. Yeah. Can you come like the protein which like one hundred million years ago? No, no, no. The, okay, the contamination is on, is mostly occurring while you work with it. Contamination is from us. So the shark or whatever else you work with is usually not getting contaminated when you when you just when you just find it. Yeah. Think of uh, something like other tissue types that get pretty 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 rigid. Yeah. And inside there's a the soft tissue, including and uh, including cells. Um, they are then hopefully preserved in a way. DNA will be fragmented, will be get in, in short pieces, but it will not be contaminated from other regions because the tissue around is still sufficiently rigid. The contamination usually occur when we dig it out, when we start making subsamples of it, and when we work with it in the lab without using sterile conditions. Then our own Homo sapiens DNA, yeah, from upper skin and from hair and whatever else, and my talking, yeah, gets in there, and directly is much frequently much higher and in higher, much higher densities than that little bit of original DNA that you have from your from your tissue. Yeah, so contamination is more the lab problem than the storage problem. And if you do it properly. With the and the proper institutes, with clean air, with and whatever else, you have a fair chance that the contamination is not acute. And when you work with the sharks and you contaminate it with human DNA, you see the difference. Yeah, of course, you do database check and you see, hey, this is more shark, this is more than more human. Okay. If you, however, work with Neanderthaler or other prime or, or other uh, hominids, and you don't know. How big is the difference between Homo sapiens and the other? You do not know if the DNA you have from mine or is it from the Neanderthal. There is public science. Not with sharks or other things that are hundreds of million years evolutionary away. Okay? Did I answer your question? Of course, of course, everywhere. All organisms share 
at least a fraction of identical proteins that once originated and since three billion years used. And this is what we look for in some genes, for example, ribos ribosomal genes, yeah, part RNA, part proteins, whatever, yeah. Every organism has ribosomes that make proteins. So when in 1970, whatever, I keep on forgetting, um, the big domains of life have been established. Archaea, bacteria, and uh, eukaryotes, and the relationship to each other. That we found that the weak eukaryotes, that we are closer to the archaea than to all other bacteria, that's been based on a gene, on the so-called 18, uh, 18S gene, which is used for your rivals, which is present since the origin of all organisms up to now. So we just have to take this gene from, from the bacteria and from the archaea and from us eukaryotes and compare it with some sophisticated algorithms. And we then can make a molecular phylogeny that tells us, hey, we are closer to the archaea than to all other bacteria or to all bacteria, yeah? So yes, all our knowledge is based first of all, of course, on morphology, but then supported by the molecules in the last couple of decades, which then frequently supported, sometimes even contradicted the morphological ideas, yeah? And at the base of the, of the uh, animal tree, there must be something simple which doesn't have a gut or nervous system or whatever else. So it could only be either spondylus or corals, but uh, corals suddenly they have some muscle tissue. Yeah? So therefore they're probably more adept and more derived than sponges. So therefore sponges were pretty quickly found to be the first or pretty much branching first uh, among all other animals. And earlier than sponges, it's just unicellular organisms. So therefore, nothing that we would define now as animals. Yeah, so it's now a mixture of using proteins and or other DNA data, uh, which is combined between all organisms around that can bring us the picture of the overall tree of life and therefore support the first branching from all other animal phyla, other sponges, and the closest rela relative to all animals, other chromosomes. Okay. With some animals, a good question. Uh, with some animals, they try to get it back by sendable crossing. There's still some leftovers in close relatives in alleles, which are may, maybe uh, not dominant, but somehow buried, which can be kind of put together artificially and to, to gain the new phenotype or a genotype of the uh, extinct organism out of which you can get with some smart reading the, the original phenotype. Otherwise, things are getting a little bit tricky. Yeah? Then you should actually have a crude idea how that looked like easy, uh, previously. You should be able what kind of genes have been around. Inserting, however, a new organisms, different genes now, is possible. So we can take artificial genes, artificial genomic makeup, excite it, put it somewhere else, insert it. The techniques are around. The bigger problem is, however, the ethics. Should we do that? Yeah? Should we now try to uh, get some new life forms with it? Where does it stop? Yeah? Do we stop with, uh, with farm animals or do we also use it at some moment to make a super humans or stuff like that, yeah? This is certainly something where the technology is sufficient, yeah? But uh, the ethics is a kind of different space. So that's it. 
identify it with some smart reading that assign some alleles and some genomic makeup, which can therefore be enriched in the, in the new images. And then what else is missing can also be artificially included. I'm not that much into that field, how to create new things, yeah? But this is at least how I could imagine how that would look like. Are you trying it? Are you trying it yourself? Okay, good. Let us know in advance. All right, more questions? Good. You're the, you're the moderator. My yeah, I don't know why, but I simply don't. Therefore, we have to look at, at the genomes. We have now as the first, I think there's only one freshwater sponge genome published. And it's one of those widespread guys, Epigatia, so we have it now. Yeah, one of the Epigatia, I guess. And uh, it produces gamuls, and we can now trace back what is now making sure that gamuls are produced, yeah, which genes are necessary, which ones are expressed. Now we have to get some of those that do not produce it and just compare. Yeah, we can do this with transcri transcriptomic studies where we just check which messenger RNA is produced and check maybe there's something missing here, yeah? But this is still work in the making, so we don't know. But you know, switching something off is much easier than to gain something new, yeah? Making gamuts is probably lots of genes necessary, but just switching it off is just one single mutation that a protein is not produced anymore, which leads that the next protein is not produced anymore. Um, so switching off is easy. Why they do it? No clue, um, but it's one of those questions we are up. What is the determining factor which authorization occurs in one human? Good question. Um, I would think predation is dominant, but it's not original. It didn't originate first. So um, predators got enormous advantages by the possibility that they could pick up proteins without having to produce them themselves. So making proteins out of probably, well, if you're, if you're, if you're, let's say, plant eater and, or sediment eater, and getting proteins from that is much more difficult than if you're able to get already proteins from muscle or anything else by predation. So this therefore led to maybe an evolutionary advantage that you're not so um, that you're not so uh, relying on too much abundance of the of plant and grazing and something like that. The energy value of being a of your prey is usually higher than if you are a grazer, yeah. And therefore, you got immediately within shortest time a good advantage that you got lots of energy with with comparatively small effort. Cows are grazing every day, 
Yeah, the lion is hunting once a week. Yeah, so therefore the, the advantage is huge. Then you are suddenly at circumstances where the regular food, like the responders, are not given anymore in the deep sea. But you still need food. You cannot go grazing because there's nothing there. Your uh, favorite symbionts are not living there because they need sunlight. Um, so therefore, there was one happy mutation, or a bunch of happy mutations, that caused the possibility that enzymes are produced that can directly digest um, all kinds of shrimps or whatever else which are seen in the environment. And then a happy accident as well, that some of your skeletal parts have been arranged in a way that these spray got entangled. And then some additional happy accidents caused that these carnivorous guys become very, very successful. So I guess to answer your question, every lineage has its different trajectories how the carnivory originated. In plants different probably, in fondus differently, and of course among all the uh, megazone uh, lineages as well. Yeah, to make a probably pretty uh, difficult to answer question short, there's probably not one single answer to your question. Probably every kingdom, every lineage has its only has its own reasons how it originates. Yes, exactly. And a bunch of happy accidents that occur during mutations. This is what we try to find out. Why does such a small genome, probably early evolving, why does it already have this enormous setup? We don't know. This is what this is currently a good question. This is my research question. This is what I try to find out currently. Yeah, checking out what is, and I think we'll be going to meet next week Friday as well. Yeah, so we're trying to to find with markers first of all how are all these fungus related? Who is producing what? Are those who are closely related producing the same, or is there lots of independent evolution of all these proteins that um, cause uh, the uh, the metabolic effects? We don't know yet. We even don't know yet what are the machineries of uh, biocompound production, which are very well known in plants, terpenes, for example. How does it work in fungus? We are not yet. We are at the very beginning here. Yeah. So good question. Because this is a very hot topic, and I would be happy to answer it. But uh, if I could answer it now, I wouldn't have anything to do currently to research it. Okay. I would have to look for something else. A bit loud there. I, I, I didn't get your, your question completely. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the, the question was how the fossils still could be used. There are two possibilities. Once, usually in fossils, there's hardly any DNA. Fossil actually means that the organic component got uh, petrified, got remineralized. Uh, there's no DNA there anymore. So. But we still can use this to calibrate when this lineage 
has been living. So we can do some carbon dating or other kinds of iso isotope dating, and we can see, okay, this is from, I don't know, 30 million years ago. Then we can take a recent organism and use a molecular clock and check out, for example, uh, use this as, as calibration, check out from the, from, the, from the recent, how now all other organisms which are closely related, when they might have split off. This is a calibration for our tree, tells us this is 0.8 million years, it's in the line of this particular organism, yeah? And all the closely related ones, we extract DNA and check out how the substitutions and mutations occurred and calculate it back and calculate when to what particular moment these lineages have been split off. So we can use with this then the non-DNA bearing fossils with, um, for usage in molecular clocks. Sometimes we can be, however, lucky and find still some tissue leftovers with DNA. We don't call it then fossils anymore. Yeah, uh, these remnants out of which we will get an ancient DNA, they will also then much better help us with molecular clocks or anything like that. Yeah, but we do not call them fossils in the trick too because they're not completely remineralized. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. 